Ancient stories usually translate fairly well for modern audiences because even though they're set over 2,000 years ago, they often carry universal themes. Tragic heroes brought down by fatal flaws, or the fight against fate, or by the choice between love and duty, etc, etc. Often the anachronisms play second fiddle to a story that works across cultures and across time. The late 5th century Athenian playwright Aristophanes, who I did a video on a few weeks ago, is the one glaring exception to this. His plays don't age as well as other ancient Greek plays because they're comedies, they're political satires that are very much set in their day. And comedy ages badly compared to other forms of entertainment, generally speaking, but satire especially loses its sting after a little while. And the exception to this exception is Lysistrata, which in the 21st century is by far the most performed of Aristophanes' plays. So in this video we're going to dive into the plot a little bit and explore why Lysistrata still appeals to 21st century audiences, but we're also going to look at some of the bits that might go over the head of the average theatregoer because, well, because they're not a 5th century Athenian. So without further ado, the Lysistrata. So the play begins with our main character, Lysistrata, entering the stage, and her name is an immediate giveaway as to what her goal is. Lysistrata in Greek means disbander of armies. At the time that this play was performed in 411 BCE, Athens was involved in a war with Sparta that had gone on for 20 years. Aristophanes hated this war, and most of his plays are overtly pro-peace. So Lysistrata, echoing the thoughts and feelings of the man who wrote her, has organised a huge gathering of all the women in Greece to where they're going to discuss how to organise peace. While waiting for the other women to arrive late, Lysistrata moans to her friend Kalaniki about the state of the country. She's distraught that the other women can't be punctual for what is definitely the most important meeting of their lives, because the salvation of all of Greece is in their hands, something that Lysistrata repeats more than once during the opening scene. And there's a great deal of significance to the fact that Lysistrata repeats herself and the words she uses when she does so. So Lysistrata uses the words elados and polis interchangeably. So helados is the Greek word for, well, Greece, and polis is the Greek word for city-state, of which there were many to be found in Greece. The significant thing to remember here is that Greece has never been a single political entity, and it wouldn't become one for a very long time. Instead, the Greeks saw the world as roughly divided into three. There were the people from your polis, which was your immediate political center. Then there were xenos, foreigners, who were often fellow Hellenes who spoke Greek, worshipped a similar pantheon of deities, and had often memorized a little bit of Homer and Hesiod. And they were a fairly widespread bunch. And then there were barbaros, barbarians, people who didn't speak Greek, and whose religion, way of life, and values were totally different. They were basically foreigners times two. And so by using the words for city-state and the words for all of Greece interchangeably, it kind of sounds like Lysistrata is saying the Greeks need to put aside their squabbling and work together, which wasn't a completely alien idea at the time. I mean, it would be wrong to suggest that the Greeks didn't have some idea of a shared identity between them. That's why they have a word, Hellenes, to describe themselves. But in the context of the play, late 5th century Athens, anyone suggesting that the Greeks could just make peace and start getting along would have probably come across as ludicrously naive. I mean, in what world are Argos and Sparta going to start getting along with each other? But long-term fans of Aristophanes might not be so surprised to hear this. In his previous plays, he had often made reference to the fact that he thought that the modern-day Athenians, the people who were in Athens in his day, were far more corrupt and far less virtuous than the Athenians of the past, specifically the Athenians who had fought in the Persian Wars, which was not only for the good of their own city, it was for the good of all of Greece. And that, I think, is the point that Lysistrata is trying to make when she uses the terms polis and helades as one. That she's acting not only in the interest of Athens, her city, but in the interest of all Hellenes at the same time. Lysistrata's slightly airheaded friend Kalaniki doesn't share this attitude. She revels in the thought that Sparta might be wiped off the map and that the Thebans might all be crushed, but never stops to consider that that same fate might befall her and her community. Anyways, the play carries on, and eventually the rest of the Greek women arrive from the Peloponnesus and Boeotia, and Lysistrata is ready to make her presentation. She asks the women how they feel about ending the war, and they all respond enthusiastically. Oh god, yes, let's finish this mess. One woman stands up and declares that they must have peace, 
even if she must be cut in half like a flatfish. Another claims that she would be willing to climb mountains just to glimpse peace from the summit. And so Lysistrata reveals her plan. All of the women of Greece must abstain from sex until they can convince their husbands to make peace. And instantly all of the women start leaving. Nope, not gonna happen, can't, won't. Lysistrata even turns to one of them and says, excuse me, Mrs. Flatfish, were you not offering to be cut in half just a minute ago? Luckily, Lampito, the leader of the Spartan women, stands up and says, it is a sad thing for a woman to sleep alone, but we must have peace. And the rest of the women begrudgingly agree, and they all take an oath together to abstain from sex, saying, I will not allow either lover or husband to approach me in the state of erection. I will stay at home in unsullied chastity. I will inflame my husband's desires, but I will never willingly yield myself to him. I will not raise my slippers to the air, I will not adopt the lioness on a cheese grater position. Lioness on a cheese grater position. Lioness on a cheese grater position. Lioness on a cheese grater. So yeah, the women of Athens basically take it upon themselves to make peace happen. Or rather to force the men to make peace happen because Athenian women had no role in uh, public life. Being a female in ancient Greece, especially ancient Athens, with very, very few notable exceptions, was to go unseen, unheard, and unmentioned. 20 years earlier, the great statesman Pericles had made a speech in which he said, Great honour is hers, whose reputation amongst males is least, whether for praise or blame. Which is pretty ironic, because his partner, Aspasia, was probably the most talked about woman in Athens at the time. But yeah, you get the picture. Athens had basically maxed out its patriarchy stats. A woman's domain was the household, and its border was at the doorway. Whenever she left the house, she entered the realm of men, which, in which she would always have to wear a veil, and pretty much always have to be ex escorted by a man. I haven't drawn the characters with veils for the sake of recognising which one is which, but in the play, they do have veils on. That'll be significant later. Women also had precisely no role in politics. Despite the fact that Athens was famously a democratic state, women were completely denied the vote. Which, to be fair, most men were as well. Um, as far as democracies go, ancient Athens is, uh, is not the most democratic of them. You know, you're the first and then you're the worst. That's just how it is. When you're the first, you're also the worst. And ancient Athens was the fucking worst. The theme of the separate roles of men and women in everyday Athenian life is very, very strong in the play. From the off, the women moan about the fact that a lot of them are late because getting out of the house is so difficult for a woman because that's where all of her responsibilities are. Throughout the play, the women also make constant references to the holy pair or the two goddesses which is a reference to Demeter and Persephone, which is a mother-daughter goddess combo, who were very, very significant to women for a number of reasons, not the least of which was their centrality to the Thesmophoria, which was a women's only festival, but it was also something that was basically pan-Hellenic. It was something that almost all of the Greeks celebrated, unlike a lot of festivals like the Panathenaea or the Eleusian Mysteries, where uh, only certain places in Greece really celebrate them, the Thesmophoria is all, something all Greek women get into. So not only does it, you know, really drive home the point that women and men led very, very separate lives, it also brings something to unite all of these women from all over Greece together, because this is something they have in common. It's a shared experience, this festival. It's yet another cry to this shared Hellenic identity. And Persephone and Demeter are the perfect deities for this because they're worshipped by all of Greece. Like, Persephone and Demeter have devout followers pretty much everywhere you go. So yeah, the women are always bringing up the two goddesses. Okay, so now that we've established that 5th century Athenian women had no role in public life, let's have a look at how the Athenian men are reacting to this. Oh. Uh, so basically, they're not reacting very well. One of the men, fuming at this insolence, denounces all of womankind. Apparently it's the same old story, the unbridled licentiousness of the female sex displaying itself. He then goes on to say about how a few years prior, when they were planning an expedition to Sicily, a woman had taken to the roof to cry, woe to Adonis. Okay, so this needs a bit of explanation. So uh, four years prior to the Lysistrata being performed, the Athenians had sent a huge fleet and thousands and thousands of soldiers 
on an expeditionary force to Sicily. The idea is they'd go to the island, they'd kick around some Spartan allies, maybe get a permanent foothold on there, and turn the tide of the war, hopefully. And it did not go well at all. Um, within two years, the entire expeditionary force was wiped out by the Sicilians, the commanders were all captured and executed, and those few prisoners that were taken were sent to the Sicilian mines to be worked to death. So yeah, not great. According to Plutarch, the news of this disaster came as such a shock to the Athenians, who were incredibly confident that this would work, that when the first messenger arrived, giving them the bad news, they arrested and tortured him, believing that he was a Spartan agent who had been sent to spread misinformation and cause panic. But of course, after more messengers started arriving and it became obvious what had happened, the Athenians had to face the reality of the situation, that they had spent a lot of money on a huge fleet, and then they put a huge portion of their male population on that fleet, and that was gone, and it wasn't coming back. In the wake of this crisis, an emergency committee was formed made of very, very old magistrates and statesmen and generals and things. Funnily enough, Sophocles, the tragic playwright that wrote Oedipus Rex, he's part of this uh, selection of old men who were chosen for their experience, but also because most people under the age of 60 who were in any way involved with the military or public life had been killed in the expedition, so they don't really have anywhere else to turn. To make things worse, the Spartans had captured the fort of Decelea in northern Attica, and they could now threaten Athenian territory all year round. So the situation in Athens is really bad, and that is what this old man is blaming the woman for. Blaming women for literally everything is a little bit of a trope for the Greeks, who were superstitious enough to take something like a woman crying, woe to Adonis, as a bad omen. But it's also a nice reminder of the constant presence of very, very intense misogyny in every Greek man's worldview. And it's this kind of attitude that will characterize every single male in this play. So skipping over a little bit of slapstick in which some old men get an unwanted bath, eventually Lysistrata engages in debate with a magistrate. Lysistrata says that she and her fellow women have seized control of state finances on account of the fact that it's become very clear that this man and his fellow magistrates cannot be trusted with them. The very, very annoyed man says that he needs these funds to carry on the war, and Lysistrata responds very condescendingly by saying that that is precisely why he can't be trusted with them, and that he shouldn't worry because herself and all the other women were just doing this with the aim of keeping him safe. The magistrate gets increasingly more annoyed at the way he's being spoken to, which then rolls into Lysistrata's excellent rant. She goes on about how she and the other women had watched men ruin Greece with their war, and that whenever they'd made any kind of suggestion, they, the men would turn to them and say, mind your own damn business, stay out of this, war is men's work, or you'll have a headache for a month. Oh yeah, the play is also just filled with references to the regularity at which uh, Greek husbands and fathers would beat uh, wives and daughters and things like that. I'm gonna choose not to dwell on that too much. Lysistrata even says that when she, in the morning, walks down to the Agora, she hears people bewailing, saying, ah, is there not a man, is there not a man who can save Greece? And she concluded that the answer was clearly no, so she was gonna do it, along with the rest of the women instead. The magistrate is entirely too angry to be convinced, however, he even says he gets furious and he goes, I would rather die than be told what to do by a veil-wearing woman. He will not let these gender roles be switched, but she's gonna do it anyway. She takes off her veil and she puts it on him because, you know, symbolism. Let's take a moment to step out of the plot here and have a bit of a chat about Lysistrata as a character because she's kind of unique amongst Aristophanes' characters in that the play is named after her. Usually, Aristophanes names his plays after the chorus. The wasps has a chorus of wasps, the clouds has a chorus of clouds. You get the idea. But this one's not that. This play has two choruses. There's a chorus of old men and there's a chorus of old women, and they kind of sing at each other in argument. And the play is not named after either of them. It's named for our lead, Lysistrata. So what's so impressive about her? Well, it might be less to do with what's so impressive about Lysistrata and more to do about what is so unimpressive about the chorus. This is a uh, period in comedy in which the chorus, which was these large groups of people singing who often also acted as a narrator, 
um, was becoming less significant to the play. There was more dialogue and less songs. When you look at Aristophanes' early work, it's very, very old comedy. The chorus is incredibly central to the plot, and they get an awful lot of lines. And then as his career goes on, and by the time he's an old man writing plays like Wealth, the chorus is a very, very diminished role. Um, presumably, there were simply, it was simply more difficult to get your hands on talented singers and dancers who you could choreograph and write for and things like that. Or maybe just the format of the genre was changing, comedy was becoming less musical and more about funny dialogue. But Lysistrata is kind of in the middle of this, so it might be Aristophanes moving away from having the chorus be the centre of attention and instead writing funny characters. Because outside of the fact that she's a woman, there's not really that much that sets Lysistrata apart from other protagonists in Aristophanes' plays. Most of them are basically about the sane man in the land of the mad. Dicaeopolis in the Arcanians is very similar to Lysistrata, in that they have a single-minded goal that they're working towards, and they're also the only person in the state who seems to be able to see the benefits of what they're doing. You know, the one sane person in the land of the mad, yet again. Trigaeus in Peace, very, very similar. You know, he is the one guy who can organize, who sees that peace is a good idea and can organize a solution. And Lysistrata is just the latest in a line of characters like this. Lysistrata is smarter than all of the men in the city, but she's also smarter than basically all of the women too. They start to break down very quickly. They lose sight of the goal of peace. They start to miss their husbands, miss their children, miss the home that was their, that was their domain, you know? Whilst Lysistrata doesn't. She doesn't have a husband or lover that we know of, if she does he's not mentioned, who she misses. She doesn't seem to struggle with her sexual urges like the rest of the women do. In many ways, Lysistrata is quite a lot like the city's patron goddess, Athena, in that she's seemingly asexual. Uh, she's incredibly cunning. She looks out for the good of all of Greece, not just Athens and she can be incredibly underhanded when she wants to be. And she's capable of keeping her fellow women on track towards the goal of peace. Even when one of the women's husbands comes a-knocking, trying to convince his wife to come home, Lysistrata helps her stand by her decision not to let her husband touch her until he can prove that he has voted for peace. As he walks away, frustrated at this rejection, he comes across a Spartan with a huge bulge around his crotch. The Spartan insists that he's only here to speak about peace with an Athenian man magistrate, but nobody's buying it. They all reckon that's a spear he's hiding in there. The stranger claims that it's just a Spartan walking stick, but the Athenians aren't convinced. So they derobe to reveal giant erect phalluses. So yeah, side note in general, ancient Greek theatre, they loved wild costumes. Over the top wigs, huge dramatic masks, crazy outfits, all of that stuff. And in this play, as of about the halfway point, all of the men who get increasingly sexually frustrated wear giant over-the-top strap-on leather phalluses. So yeah, the Athenians get naked and are like, brah, look at this. Ridiculous. And the Spartan is like, you think that's bad? Check this out. And slowly, the Spartans and Athenians put two and two together until one of them says, hey, do you think the women planned this? Good job, you really fucking nailed that one. Um, me and your father are very proud of you. So yeah, long story short, the men of both cities eventually agree to a peace treaty supervised by Lysistrata. The two choruses, which previously had been the men's chorus and the women's chorus, come together and they sing a united song. And then everyone gets roaringly drunk in the Temple of Athena, which... Ancient Greece, you know, good times. So yeah, that's the Lysistrata, and it made quite a splash, although I'm not sure anyone back then was all that surprised by the themes of the play. Aristophanes had about two decades of critical acclaim and plays under his belt at this point, and all of them had basically gone along the theme of peace is good. So people probably weren't shocked that he wrote another peace is good play. But what makes it one of his most interesting works is how it's still relevant today. The emphasis on the futility of conflicts between people who often have much more in common than they care to admit. And, you know, the obvious one, which is the experiences of the two sexes and the rivalries that that can sometimes form. Still relevant, arguably always relevant. In 2015, for example, Spike Lee made a movie called Chirac, which is literally just Lysistrata, only set in Chicago's South Side. And the movie isn't loosely based on the play or vaguely reminiscent of Aristophanes. The main character's name is Lysistrata. 
It is the exact same plot, only copy pasted to the modern United States. And it works. But we also have to remember the events of this play never happened. Peace wouldn't come for another seven years, and it wasn't because the Athenian women forced it, it was because the Spartans forced it by destroying the Athenian fleet, laying siege to the city, and forcing a surrender, which is sadly how most wars are won. In fact, mere months after Lysistrata is performed, an oligarchic coup overthrows the Athenian democracy and starts doing war even harder. And then the democracy comes back and starts doing war even harder. And as far as historians can tell, the women of Athens did very, very little to try and stop it. Which makes sense, because something like this could never happen in real life, you know? Like, a sex strike could never actually result in change, right? Um, I'd like you to hold your cynicism right there, buddy, because actually, no. In Colombia alone, there's been at least three since 1997. It started as an initiative by the military's commander-in-chief in an attempt to bring about a ceasefire with some guerrilla fighters that he was warring against. It wasn't all that effective on this first run, but it did see more success when tried again in 2006. This time, the initiative was taken by the wives and girlfriends of the Perriera gangsters after violent deaths in the city began increasing. The strike of the crossed legs was fairly successful. Apparently, the city City's murder rate dropped by 26.5% after the strike. Hmm. But it looks like the most effective of these Colombian sex strikes took place in 2011, when the women of Barbacoas protested the lack of roads from their rural towns to nearby population centres. This may not seem like much, but it's actually my favourite of these sex strikes because it makes so much sense. The whole point of it is without roads from these rural areas, Women couldn't get to hospital to give birth, and so the rates of mortality to, for women in childbirth had gotten really, really high. So their whole point was, it is not safe for us to have sex, because the potential consequences of sex, getting pregnant, could kill us. And it worked. The government caved in 112 days and started dishing out money to build roads with. I've singled out Colombia, but similar things have happened all over the globe. In Kenya, a sex strike that was aimed at forcing men in government to just get it together for God's sake, was so well organised that the WDO even managed to raise funds to pay all the local prostitutes to just take a holiday, to make sure that no one jeopardised their plan. The Philippines has had one, Liberia's had one, even fucking Belgium has had a sex strike. And funnily enough, the senator who was involved in it, a woman called Marlene Temerman, uh, responded to critics of the strike by saying that they didn't have a sense of humour. Which is, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure Aristophanes chuckled in his grave when he heard that one. This, by the way, is not to try and paint Aristophanes as some ancient feminist. He almost certainly wasn't actually advocating for women to get involved in politics. If anything, to the intensely patriarchal Athenians, the absurdity of the situation that women could change anything would have basically been so out there that it gives Aristophanes a really good opportunity to make more scathing and risky critiques of his city's politics. But that hasn't stopped Lysistrata from rising above the rest of Aristophanes' plays to where it continues to enjoy a great deal of acclaim and relevancy and continues to get reactions out of audiences to this day, which is honestly quite rare amongst the classics. So to conclude, if you haven't read Lysistrata, you should. And then you should read the rest of Aristophanes. Or you can just watch the video that I did on him. And, uh, you know, if you're going to protest something, you could always do it the old-fashioned way with signs and slogans and chants in the streets. Or you can get creative with it, take some inspiration from Lysistrata, and hit those in power where it really hurts them. In their Spartan walking sticks. Thanks for watching.